So hi guys, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is the first talk on the Navarra Media stage and it's called Is Capitalism Doomed? And it is my great pleasure. Uh, actually, I actually should introduce myself. I'm Moya Lothian McLean. I work at Navarra. I'm merely here to facilitate. But it is my great pleasure to be joined today, all the way over there, look how far apart these No, I was thinking that. It's a bit weird. <laughs> great divide. To be joined today by Grace Blakely, an economist and author of several books, the most recent being Vulture Capitalism. Grace, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Lovely to see so many smiling faces. I think we should start with the basics, okay? Sure. Vulture Capitalism. Yeah. What is the basic premise? Okay, so vulture capitalism is just capitalism. I had to come up with a snappy name for my book, which is about how capitalism really works. And vulture capitalism was something we settled on based on a number of different stories that I have in the book to illustrate the point. So the basic premise of this book is that capitalism is not as we're often led to believe, a free market system. You know, we have this view of capitalism as something that's like nice, decentralized, democratic system uh, where markets decide uh, who gets what, right? And this was a really central part of the ideology that underpins this system and that underpinned the big transformation that we had in the 1980s towards a more, in inverted commas, free market system. The idea being that you had the state on the one side and the market on the other side. And if you had more market, that meant less state and vice versa. And this was all based on this, you know, USSR versus US dynamic that underpinned the Cold War. So we have this idea that capitalism means markets. You have more state, that means less capitalism. Sorry, more state, less capitalism, more markets, more capitalism. Um, and that isn't really how this system works. Contrary to this idea that you have a kind of democratic, free market, capitalist economy on the one side and a centralized authoritarian kind of socialist society on the other hand, um, capitalism is actually a highly centralized system that rests not just on markets, but also on centralized planning, basically, a kind of authoritarian, hierarchical, oligarchic system where a few people at the very top of society get to decide who gets what. And we're told that that's not how it works. We're told that we're free, that we're all free to choose where we work, how we live, what we consume. And yet so many of the decisions that actually ground those choices, the framework in which we all live our lives has already been set by someone, some institution somewhere else in the system. And it's not the case that you have this separation between big corporations, financial institutions on the one hand, and then governments on the other hand. And they're in this war over the kind of boundaries of capitalism. No, instead you have more often than not a kind of fusion of public and private interests in service of basically the interests of those at the top. Um, so states and markets aren't separate as, as you might believe. And I illustrate these points with a number of different stories. And I'll just briefly talk about one now, if that's all right, just to kind of give you this some This is what you're here for, Chris. I also just <laughs> want to say that while we're here, we have the wonderful Christine de Blaise, who is doing BSL Woo! interpretation. So just a hand for Christine. Keep your eyes on her if needed. Let, tell us a story. Tell us I will a story tell about us capitalism. Story. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you several stories about capitalism. So the one that I open the book with is, is the example of Boeing. Now, many of you may be familiar with Boeing recently. It's been in the news a few times. One of the doors blew out of its planes mid-flight. Many doors many blew doors. out of many yeah. planes. <laughs> Um, there's been a whole series of engineering failures. And if you think back to 2018 and 2019, um, two Boeing 737 MAX planes crashed. They literally fell out of the sky. This was the 737 MAX disasters. And initially, Boeing tried to blame the pilots of these planes for what had gone wrong. But eventually, it was revealed that there was actually a fault with the planes themselves. There was something called the MCAS system, which was a piece of software that had been put into these planes, um, and the pilots weren't aware of its existence. Now, the reason for this, uh, the, you know, the implementation of this software was that Boeing had made these massive, massive planes. Uh, and basically they'd done so because, you know, they were on a drive to increase profits, minimize their costs. Making big planes was going to be more profitable for them. It was going to allow them to make deals with other airline carriers. And they kind of pushed this through. Uh, without really kind of following the right safety protocols. Um, a number of engineers came forward and tried to blow the whistle saying these planes aren't safe. The regulator at the time um, was actually, uh, the, the Boeing was being regulated by a unit of the FAA that sat inside Boeing and whose workers were being paid by Boeing. The CEO at the time had said, you've got to deliver this massive plane that's going to make us tons of money uh, in half the time at a, a much lower cost than what you delivered the last round of planes. So naturally, his first enemies were the unions, 
which, you know, Boeing went to war with, the whistleblowers that came forward. Uh, and in the place of those institutions, the new CEO put in place um, a bunch of kind of managers that would basically override uh, the, um, you know, the whistleblowers and, and all the kind of information that was coming forward from the shop floor. Um, and it kind of later transpired that senior executives at Boeing had known about the flaws in this plane, in these set of planes, before they went to market. Just before these disasters happened, uh, a, a debate had been taking place in Congress in the US about airline safety. Um, and some, you know, Congress people had been saying, oh, well, you know, maybe, you know, we need a bit more regulation of aviation. And actually, a group within Congress said, we need less because no airline manufacturer is going to manufacture a plane that would harm its reputation. The market will sort everything out. The government can get out of the way. So there was another round of deregulation that was introduced. But what's interesting about the Boeing story, right, is that, you know, this massive company exists in a kind of monopolistic industry. It doesn't have very much competition. Manufactures planes that end up nosediving out of the sky. This killed nearly 350 people in two separate crashes. It sounds like it's a kind of classic failure of the market, right? This is a company that got too big and too powerful and wasn't subject to enough regulation. Actually, this crisis, this, this series of catastrophes was like a joint venture between the US government and this company, Boeing. So Boeing had been the biggest recipient of corporate welfare in 2018 and 2019. It got massive tax breaks, massive subsidies, a huge amount of support from the US state. It was an integral part of the military industrial complex. It had massive contracts with the Pentagon. And in fact, the transition within Boeing that led the company to focus so resolutely on shareholder value um, rather than kind of lionizing engineering expertise as it once did, was engineered by the American state, which said, you need to merge with this other failing aviation company, McDonnell Douglas, which provides us with a lot of contracts in which we need to basically stay alive. So you can't make this clear distinction as to what happened. It's not as though Boeing got carried away and it wasn't being regulated properly. And if we had a bigger state doing more things, then that would have made the situation better. Because actually in this case of kind of capitalism run amok the blame can be laid just as much at the feet of big government as it can big business so then the question is how do we fight back against this kind of toxic fusion of what is effectively planned capitalism anti-democratic capitalism that provides us with few ways of holding those at the top at the top to account they're not going to be held accountable through the market and they're not going to be held accountable through the government so how do we help them to account? Well, we have to do it ourselves. Well, and how do we do it ourselves? And how Come do we on. do that? What's the, what's the I was going to carry on, but I didn't want to <laughs> deprive no. you of the role. Of As I said, I'm just, I'm just facilitating. You're on a roll, Grace. <laughs> okay, fine. I've done quite a few of these. The book came out in March, so uh, it's been a while. Um, so <laughs> what can we do about that? Uh, we have to kind of find this third force within society that allows us to create accountability, that allows us to pull power down from these institutions that dominate our lives. Um, and yeah, really kind of democratize all of the systems under which we live, democratize our politics, democratize corporations, democratize finance. And I look at lots of ways that we can do that in the book. The two examples that I like to use is the example of Boeing is on the one hand, and then Lucas Aerospace, on the other hand, so Lucas Aerospace was a big aviation company in the UK that was around in the 1970s. Um, and it was about to go under, it was under threat from competition from abroad. Um, and so the unionists at Lucas Aerospace went to the then Minister for Trade and Industry, Tony Benn, um, and they said, can you nationalize us? And Tony Benn said, no, the Labour government's in a bit of trouble, we can't nationalize the company. But why don't you guys go away and come up with a plan as to what we could do with Lucas Aerospace as to how we could save it? So the unionists went away um, and at first they tried to consult a bunch of academic experts and they got like no replies. So eventually they come up with this radical idea of why don't we actually ask the workers who are doing this work how they think this company should be run. And they were a bit skeptical at first. They were like, we don't really know what we're going to get back. The response they got was astonishing. They had workers from the across the corporation saying, 
Firstly, we're producing weapons that are being used by authoritarian regimes all around the world. We don't want to do that anymore. We want to produce socially useful technologies. We want to produce kidney dialysis machines, wind turbines. And here are all the instructions and specifications that you will need to show how we can use the resources that we have now to transform this corporation into producing things that are completely different. Oh, and by the way, we think that this firm should be run completely differently as well. We don't need to be managed. We don't need this rigid hierarchy where people at the top are controlling our every move and telling us what to do all the time. We believe that we can actually govern ourselves. It's a very radical idea within this corporation. Um, we believe that we can create a kind of democratic, publicly owned company that produces socially useful technologies in place of this kind of hierarchical private company that produces weapons at the moment. Now, this document was a kind of lightning rod for radicals all over the UK. It was something for unionists to applaud for the peace movement, the environmental movement, even the Financial Times and kind of, you know, representatives, uh, liberal representatives and people in the House of Commons came forward and started saying, wow, this is amazing. How could these workers come up with this idea? And I think this distinction is actually what tells us the most about the difference between capitalism and socialism the distinction between Boeing and Lucas Aerospace. It's not which had the biggest government telling them what to do and that determines which is more socialist. It's not which is most subject to kind of free market principles and subject to the most competition because neither of these firms were subject to very much competition. Both uh, worked with and around their governments um, and existed in a context that was kind of, you know, uh, yeah, set by these big states that were very much kind of in, in line with the interests of the owners of these big corporations. The difference between these two examples of how to run a big aerospace company is one was based on a principle of democracy and one was based on a principle of hierarchy and authoritarianism. It's not a coincidence that Boeing had to force through this transition to a cost-cutting, profit-focused agenda um, and that it had to basically destroy the union movement within that corporation in order to do it. It's not a coincidence that it had to push back against whistleblowers and basically uh, insert a new massive layer of management uh, because, you know, doing that kind of transition, forcing workers to do something that they don't think is right um, and forcing them to do so simply in order to kind of maximize profits for those in the top, that requires hierarchy, domination, control, the exercise of authority. That's what makes capitalism work every day because we're all forced to show up to work. We're forced to do what our managers tell us to do. We're forced to do what governments tell us to do. You know, we are forced at kind of pain of starvation and destitution to just go with the flow and basically obey most of the rules that are set by other people around us. What made the Lucas plan so radical is that it completely upset that hierarchy and that exercise of authority that sits at the core of capitalism. And it said, workers can be in, in charge. They can determine what they're gonna make, how they're gonna produce, how they're gonna manage themselves. And for that reason, it was incredibly radical. And obviously it was crushed. Thatcher came to power in the 1980s saying, I want to promote free markets. I wanna make everyone free. I wanna reduce the size of the state and make everyone into a little entrepreneur. But that isn't what happened. Neoliberalism and the Thatcherite project didn't lead to a smaller state as anyone who was involved in the miners' strike or any protest movement since then could tell you. The state is very big and strong and powerful if you are protesting against it, or if you're a banker who's in need of a bailout, or if you're a massive company that needs a bailout during a financial crisis. The state never really got smaller. What it did do was shift its focus away from, you know, in the social democratic period, for example, organizing with workers to manage demand and, you know, uh, make sure that the economy was working for everyone towards simply pursuing profit at all cost. And that required not more freedom, it required more control, more domination. And that was exercised, yes, through a very authoritarian state, but also through really authoritarian corporations. And the dispersal of this kind of ideology that discourages us from conceiving of ourselves as part of a group that can change things. There was this ideology of individualism um, that you would 
become this kind of, you know, perfect little free market entrepreneur by competing with everyone around you, um, by having your own pensions portfolio, by having your own home, by managing your assets and liabilities over the course of your lifetime, by trying to compete with all of those people around you in your workplace, in your community, whatever, whether that was by buying a new Range Rover or investing in your human capital by getting yourself a degree. Um, this idea of kind of creating an entrepreneurship of the self to make yourself into the perfect neoliberal subject who would only think about competition with those around you rather than collaborating in order to resist this system that was exploiting you. And those were the real shifts that we started to have in the 1980s. That was the neoliberal shift. It wasn't about free markets. It wasn't even about shrinking the size of the state. It was actually about retooling the state to make it serve the interests of capital. And it was about crushing popular power to make us compete with each other instead of cooperating and collaborating to build something new. Um, and in the final bit of the book, I look at all of the amazing experiments that have existed since the Lucas plan in democratic self-governance. Um, so people taking charge of their workplaces, their communities, taking charge of the streets, whatever they're doing. And the astonishing capacity of ordinary human beings in all different walks of life from all different parts of the world to govern themselves, to manage themselves, and to resist the exercise of domination and control by those who would, on any kind of measure, say that they had more power. Um, there are some really interesting examples, like there's a village in North Wales called Blyneye Festiniog. I mean, this was a really left behind town um, it was subject to all these kind of government interventions that were trying to kind of drag it back up again. And at some point, the people in this village said, we think we can do this better ourselves. So they started a bunch of community uh, owned companies. Um, they started to uh, buy up some of the shop fronts using the profits that had been generated by these companies and then rent them out to local businesses. Ultimately, they realized that this was a former slate mining town. Um, so there were very high rates of fuel poverty, lots of slate insulation. And there was a big foreign energy company that was they're generating hydroelectric power in the mountains nearby. So they were like, why can't we start our own community energy company and use it to deal with fuel poverty? And they did that and they managed the whole transition and they set up institutions to be able to do that. And suddenly politicians were coming down and saying, how did you do this? How can we do this everywhere else? You know, we want to replicate this model from the top down. And the answer from them was, no, this is something that came from our community and can be done in lots of other places, but you can't do it for us. Um, and I think, you know, a big problem with, like the left that we've had for quite some time is people who think they know a lot. And I think I'm guilty of this as well. I remember going around the country during the 2019 election being like, vote for Labour, we're gonna make your lives better. And then seeing these faces of people being like, yeah, well, we've been told that a number of times before. Why should I believe you? You're not even from here. Like you don't know any of my issues or whatever. And we do tend to do that. We tend to kind of treat people as, um, you know, uh, kind of receivers of our ideas. Uh, as though we can kind of go in a into a community and say, vote for us, we're going to make your life better or join our movement, we're going to make your life better. When actually it that just kind of reinforces the sense of alienation and disempowerment that makes people not want to get involved in politics in the first place and that makes them much easier to control and exploit. So when we can, as the left, I think, push back against this model by encouraging people to organize collectively and conceive of themselves as part of a wider group that can fight for change in their places. I think that is the foundations of a movement that is gonna be much more successful than anything we've seen in the past. And is really the only way to fight back against the sense of pervasive anger, apathy, disillusionment that comes from existing in a society in which your entire life is controlled, but you're constantly being told that you're free. The title of this talk is, is Capitalism Doomed? Even if there is not an intervention of the type you talk about, is capitalism currently in some sort of death spiral, but who is it taking down in its current form? I mean, capitalism is at this point in time so interwoven with every system that we use to reproduce existence that it is hard to imagine capitalism imploding without it taking everything with it, right? And that's the problem. It's how do we start to build ways of living that aren't based on principles of capital accumulation on the one hand and kind of domination and control and hierarchy on the other hand that have brought us to this point. 
Um, and how do we do that locally and at scale over a relatively short period of time? Because, you know, if we are thinking about the most likely thing to bring capitalism down, bring civilization down, we all know it is climate breakdown and it is coming much, much faster than anticipated. And there are two options. You know, you will often hear people kind of in the center saying, we don't have time to do this properly. You know, we need to deal with the world as it exists now. We need to just, um, you know, impose carbon taxes, act very quickly, kind of do what we can to tinker around the edges of the system to try and like, you know, create some change uh, and decarbonize. The problem is, is that if we don't start from the bottom up, if we don't start forcing accountability through our political systems, then ExxonMobil is going to continue running things behind the scenes. There's another example that I use in the book of ExxonMobil itself, actually. This was a company that knew about climate breakdown as early as the 1970s. It had its research scientists look into the greenhouse gas effect, found very clear evidence that burning fossil fuels was going to create the greenhouse gas effect. And instead of doing something about it, they uh, slashed the funding for their climate research team, fired all the scientists and put all the money into climate denialism and have continued to do that for a very, very long time since. And they did it in a very clever way. They didn't just say burning fossil fuels doesn't cause climate breakdown. They funded lots of studies that would say scientists are unsure as to whether burning fossil fuels causes climate breakdown. And they sponsored all of these groups. They lobbied very hard. They put tons of money into the US government. Eventually, their former CEO became Secretary of State under Donald Trump because of the close close links between this corporation and the American state. You know, I've only given you two examples now, but the book is littered with them. Uh, so many governments see it as their role. And I, I think we have one right now, not to protect their populations, but actually to make the world safe for their businesses. And that's definitely something we see with the fossil fuel industry. So how do we conceivably fight back against climate breakdown when our governments, which are the only institutions that have the capacity to move us at scale away from fossil fuels, are basically owned by the fossil fuel companies. You know, the only way that we can actually do that is through this process of democratization, which cuts back against capitalism as well. You know, if we see capitalism as not just a system that is based on free markets and therefore having more state will undermine, you know, the operation of capitalism, we know that's not true. If we see capitalism as a system that is fundamentally at its core, a system based on domination, then moving away from that and democratizing society at every level moves us away from capitalism. It also allows us to create mechanisms of accountability that mean that ExxonMobil can't control our government or BP can't control our government or whoever can't have so much access and influence that is able to undercut any measures that we um, attempt to implement. And that requires us to organize on so many different levels. It requires us organizing on our communities. And I've got a load of great examples in the book as to how people have done that in our workplaces, whatever your workplace is and however you might organize on the streets as hard as the government is trying to make it for us. And they're trying to make it hard for us for a reason. And that's because it works. All of these methods, we have to start now. And it seems slow and agonizing and not enough at the time just to show up and demand change. But realistically, it is the only way through. Perfect timing, as I've just been told that we have to wrap it up. Okay. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to our guest, economist Grace Blakely. Her book, Vulture Capitalism, is out now. You can get it at all good bookstores and maybe some more nefarious ones too.